Greetings, confirmands. Welcome to our first virtual confirmation lesson. While I'm sad that we can't continue, continue our journey together in person, I'm really glad that we're finding a way to continue our journey together virtually. Today we'll be talking about Presbyterian heritage and history. On a normal day, a normal year in confirmation, this lesson would take place in Montreat, North Carolina as part of our day retreat there. We would worship with Montreat Presbyterian Church that morning and we would experience the ways in which we are similar because we're Presbyterians and the ways our congregations are different because we find ourselves in different places and our pews are filled with different members. After worship, we'd head over to the Presbyterian Heritage Center located there, which is a place full of documents and artifacts and exhibits that educate folks on the Presbyterian history that we have here in the United States of America. We'd participate in a scavenger hunt and work in teams and learn about our history and heritage in that way. So today's lesson is going to look a little bit different but I hope it still teaches you some important things about what it means to be Presbyterian. I'm Presbyterian and I've been Presbyterian since I was about six years old. My mom is an organist and choir director. So my family's participation in a church often related to what church she was working in at that time. When I was born, she was working in a Methodist church. When I was in preschool, she worked at a Baptist church. But when I was in first grade, she went back to her roots, she was raised as a Presbyterian, and started working at a Presbyterian church. And that's where I was primarily formed as a Christian. I'm interested what your Presbyterian story is. That's something you're going to get a chance to share with your mentor as part of this journey. You're going to be able to share what your Presbyterian history and heritage is and hear about theirs. But I've been a Presbyterian since I was about six. I was confirmed and baptized on the same day at First Presbyterian Church of Anderson, South Carolina. When I was in college, I worshiped at a Presbyterian church in Clemson. When I went off to seminary, which is the place you go to be educated at a graduate level and prepared to be a pastor of a church, I worshiped at a Presbyterian church there in Decatur, Georgia. And now I'm serving my second congregation as an ordained Presbyterian pastor. I wanted to start off our lesson with a quote from the Westminster Catechism. It is a question that I learned as part of my confirmation journey when I was a young person, and it starts this way. What is the chief end of humanity, it asks. So what is the thing that we're here on earth to do? The answer is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. So that's something that I learned when I was being formed as a Presbyterian Christian, and it is something that has guided and shaped my life in Christ since then. So I thought that it would be nice for you to hear it, and it can maybe shape and influence our lesson. So let's kick it off. We're first going to talk a little bit about church history, just a little bit, church history with a big C. So I mean the Church of Jesus Christ throughout the world, no matter what denominational flavor that takes on. The church as we know it has been in existence for about 2,000 years. The church came about after the death and resurrection of Christ with followers who wanted to gather and continue worshiping and learning about God in the name of Christ. We officially think of the church being born on the day of Pentecost. That's something that's told about in the book of Acts chapter 2 in the Bible. When the Holy Spirit arrived with a mighty rush of wind and with power and came upon those early Christians and blessed the church and gave birth to the church. In the first 1,000 years of church history, the church, while there were moments of controversy or disagreement and churches looked different in different places, it was rather unified. The first official split of the church came in the year 1054 when we had the East-West Schism. That's where our Orthodox brothers and sisters in Christ come from, that East-West Schism. 
So if you here in Greenville have a friend who's Greek Orthodox, they come from that schism. It was just a time when um, folks in the East and folks in the West said, we have a little bit of a different way of understanding God. We still worship the same God. We still recognize Jesus as Lord. We just have some different understandings and different ways of worship. One of the key differences that we see today is the fact that Orthodox Christians celebrate a different date for Easter. But Orthodox Christians include a whole host of different churches. It includes Greek Orthodox, Russian Orthodox, Ethiopian Orthodox. So that was kind of the first official split in the church. The second official split came in the year 1517 with the Reformation, when the reformer Martin Luther nailed his list of 95 theses or complaints against the church on the door of the church in Wittenberg, Germany. That's where we come from, the Protestant Reformation. That's why we have Catholics and Protestants today. And Protestants include a whole host of denominations, Methodist, Lutherans, Episcopals, Presbyterian, and many, many more. Specifically, as Presbyterians, we come from the line of thought of John Calvin, who was a Swiss reformer who came after Martin Luther um, and wrote a whole bunch about theology, meaning what we believe about God, what the church should be, how can we get back to our roots as early Christian church, how can we tie back into that. But we specifically hail from Scotland in the year 1560, a group of individuals penned the Scots Confession of Faith and formally established the Church of Scotland, which was Presbyterian. One of the main people in that movement was a guy named John Knox. That's why we have a John Knox Presbyterian Church here in Greenville. It's named after him. But once the Presbyterian Church was established in Scotland, a lot of immigrants came over to the U.S. and they brought that denomination with them, that way of being church with them. They settled in, in Canada and Pennsylvania and then they came down into the Carolinas and Georgia. That's why we have a large concentration of Presbyterians here. And we can trace our heritage all the way back to 1560 in the Scots Confession of Faith. When we talk about Presbyterianism, Presbyterianism, in a wide sense, is basically the system of church government. There are different systems of church government. You can have the Presbyterian system, and that's the way we're organized, where we're organized into representative assembly to make decisions. Or you can have an Episcopal form of government, which is what our Episcopal brothers and sisters, so like Christ Church, or our Catholic brothers and sisters. That's the form of government they have, where you have a bishop who's in charge and tells churches what to do. You can also have a congregational form of government. That's what Baptist churches adhere to, where their local congregation makes all the decisions. So a Baptist church here in Greenville might look a little bit different from a Baptist church um, down in Columbia. So Presbyterianism basically just means the way we're organized. And Presbyterianism had a great effect on the United States government in its creation. There were some Presbyterians that were founding fathers and signed some of our important documents and helped shape how our government looks by representative assembly. In the year 1706, so all the way back then, 70 years before we officially became a country, the first presbytery or group of Presbyterian churches was organized in Philadelphia. Let's talk a little bit about what marks us as Presbyterian Christians. What are some of the key things that we believe? One of those is the sovereignty of God, meaning God's ultimate control and power and the fact that we owe our allegiance to God. God is sovereign over all. The second is human sinfulness. We don't pretend to be perfect people. We lift up that we're created in the image of God, but that as human beings, we sin, we make mistakes, we fall short. That's one of the reasons we have a corporate prayer of confession in our order of worship every Sunday. 
any Presbyterian church you go to is going to have that element because of our belief in human sinfulness and our honest acknowledgement of that. A third kind of mark of what it means to be Presbyterian is the centrality of the word. You would not find us worshiping on a Sunday morning for an official Sunday morning worship experience without having God's word from scripture read aloud and proclaimed through a sermon. We believe that God's word is divinely inspired and that it shapes us and it's meant to be questioned, wrestled with. It's meant to live inside us and encourage our actions in the world. We also believe that Jesus is the incarnation of God's word and it's Christ who we should ultimately look to for how to live a life of faith. But we believe in the centrality of the word. Another belief is that Jesus alone is Lord of the conscience. That means that as Presbyterians, we can have things that we kind of collectively believe together that shape our faith. But ultimately, Christ is Lord of my conscience and Christ is Lord of your con conscience. Christ both um, speaks to the church, but also speaks to individuals and, con and convicts individual hearts. And a final mark that we're going to talk about today is our election. So God chooses us. God's, God elects us for service and for salvation. So when I say salvation, I mean that our ultimate end lies with God. In life and in death, we belong and rest secure in the love of God. But when I talk about service, I mean that God has also chosen and called us to do good work here on earth in our everyday lives and as part of the church. One of the ways that we as Presbyterians lift this up is by the election of officers. That's part of our form of government. We elect officers to represent the congregation on the session and make those decisions. And then those officers can go to our presbytery, which is a, a group of Presbyterian churches and make decisions there. So as Presbyterians, we can have two types of officers. We can have elders and deacons. But one of the things as Presbyterians that we don't always have to have is deacons. You can have them or you cannot have them. Westminster chooses not to have them. So we only have elders and we have both ruling elders who serve on the session and are elected in different classes for three year terms. They pray and support the congregation and make important decisions. And we also have teaching elders, pastors like me and Ben and Lee and Lauren. These are folks chosen from the body and elected to serve. I want to read you um, two short passages from scripture that kind of ground our belief in these officers and elders. The first comes from Numbers chapter 11, verses 16 and 17. So this is the Old Testament, and it's when Moses and um, the Hebrew people are traveling to the promised land. So the Lord said to Moses, Gather for me 70 of the elders of Israel, whom you know to be the elders of the people and officers over them. Bring them to the tent of meeting and have them take their place there with you. I will come down and talk with you there, and I will take some of the spirit that is on you and put it on them, and they shall bear the burden of the peoples along with you so that you will not bear it by yourself. So very early in the story of God's people, we have leaders being elected and chosen from among the body to serve and help bear the burden of the body. Another passage comes from the New Testament from the book of 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 1 through 3. So 1 Peter is a letter that tells us about the early church. Now as an elder myself and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, as well as one who shares in the glory to be revealed, I exhort the elders among you to tend the flock of God that is in your charge, exercising the oversight, not under compulsion, but willingly, as God would have you do it not for your gain, but eagerly. Do not lord it over those in your charge, but be examples to the flock. 
So we have these passages of scripture that inform how we operate as Christians as part of our Presbyterian governance. We elect leaders from among us whom we believe that God has chosen and the Spirit ordains to do the work of the church, to help us all be a better body of Christ. Now, one day you may go on to serve as an elder or deacon of a congregation, but you also may serve in other ways. We believe in the priesthood of all believers, that all of us are elected to service in some way, shape, or form. So those are some of the marks of Presbyterianism. Now let's talk specifically about our denomination and what it means to say, I go to Westminster Presbyterian Church of Greenville, South Carolina. Our denomination, the larger body that we belong to, is the Presbyterian Church in the United States of America, or the PCUSA. There are a couple of different Presbyterian denominations in our country and in the world today. Specifically, the PCUSA unified the southern strain of Presbyterians and the northern strain of Presbyterians in 1983. Those two churches split around the 1860s over the issue of slavery, and it was a really joyful and glorious thing when they reunited in 1983. Our denomination has 1.2 million members and over 9,000 congregations around the country. We are part of the Foothills Presbytery, so the northeast corner of South Carolina. We're part of the South Atlantic Synod, and we are part of the General Assembly of the PCUSA. So each of those bodies meets periodically, like our presbytery meets um, three times a year, to make decisions about what it means to be a Christian in this time and place. The General Assembly, so our large body, our national body, meets every other year to make major decisions. And representatives from each presbytery, so some churches in each presbytery, send representatives to go and make decisions. Our General Assembly met this year just a few weeks ago to make some major decisions. One of the other things that characterizes us as um, part of the PCUSA denomination is our Constitution. See that connection to the U.S. government? Which is made up of two documents. The Book of Order, which um, tells us how worship should look, tells us how sh we should organize ourselves and make decisions, and even discipline those who are maybe not following the right way. And the Book of Confessions, which is a collection of documents including the Scots Confession of Faith of 1560 that I mentioned, and the Apostles' Creed, and that Westminster Catechism that I quoted from at the beginning of our lesson. These documents um, cover the 2,000-year history of our church, and they interpret what we believe about God. They look at Scripture, they look at the world, and they interpret what it means to be a Christian in a certain time and place. And for us, the Book of Confessions specifically guides us in what it means to be a Presbyterian person of faith. Later, toward the end of this journey, you're going to write your own statement about what you believe. You might want to turn to the Book of Confessions for some inspiration and examples. Don't worry, I'll help you on that. You may be wondering, what does it mean to be a PCUSA Presbyterian? Are my friends at First Pres Greenville or John Knox Presbyterian or Second Presbyterian here in town the same type of Presbyterian that I am? There are a lot of different denominations, and those denominations split over different reasons. We're no longer a part of the same denomination as, say, First Presbyterian Church of Greenville or Second Presbyterian. Second Presbyterian went a different direction when our denomination decided to ordain women to the office, office of elder and deacon in the Presbyterian Church. We split into different denominations from First Presbyterian just a few years ago when our denomination said that it was a good thing to ordain LGBT individuals and to allow them to be married in the church. That's something First Presbyterian feels differently about. But churches like John Knox Presbyterian and Fourth Presbyterian 
are part of our denomination, part of our presbytery. We have continued to be a denomination that is open to cultural questions in a way that other denominations, both Presbyterian and not, are not always open to. Let's talk specifically about Westminster, our home church, the place where we want to be formed as Christians. Westminster had its beginnings in 1947. It was actually a church plant of First Presbyterian back when we were part of the same denomination. We're the second largest church in our presbytery of Foothills Presbytery. First Press Spartanburg is the largest. And we're in the top 47 largest churches in our denomination throughout the country. So a lot of Presbyterian churches are not quite as big as we are. One of our hallmarks is traditional worship. We have an organ and we have a choir and we worship God in a more traditional format than some others. Another mark of our church is our mission work in Greenville and in the world. 27% of our church budget goes to witness and service, to those organizations and efforts in our town and in the country and in the world to help people and to share the love of God. You may know that we have a history and heritage of being active in um, equal housing and fair housing in Greenville, in feeding folks through different food banks and organizations like Meals on Wheels and United Ministries. And we also have a history and heritage of going to work alongside our brothers and sisters in the Caribbean region in places like the Dominican Republic and Cuba and building up those bonds of faith. I want you to think about some of the other things about Westminster that make us unique, that make us Presbyterian, and that draw you in. What are those things? Are you drawn in to our worship style? Are you drawn in by our church basketball programs or opportunities for service and mission in our community and beyond? What is it that makes you Presbyterian and draws you to this place? Don't forget, you're going to get an opportunity to talk about that with your mentor. You can also talk about it with your parents and your family. I look forward to talking more about um, the things that make us who we are as Christians, both about our Presbyterian heritage and the sacraments and gifts God has given us and the way that we can serve the church as we finish up this confirmation journey. You have a few assignments that are attached to this lesson today. You should have received them via email. They involve looking at some documents that I've provided for you that are part of our Book of Confessions. And they involve going to the website of that Presbyterian Heritage Center I told you about and choosing something that you want to explore more there. You'll find more details in your email. So I'm so glad that we share this Presbyterian Christian heritage together. I'm glad to connect with you in this way. And I look forward to hearing about what you learn, what you experience, and what you think about being Presbyterian. Y'all have a good day.